عزت ماب وائس چانسلر صاحب محترم مہمان خصوصی علی نواز میمر صاحب عزت ماب ڈینس پرنسپل آفیسرز اے محترم استاد صاحبان ماں سندس نثار تمام سبنی آئلینڈ کے بھلی کار چوان تھی ہن پروگرام میں جین جو عنوان آئے اپرچونیٹیز اینڈ چیلنجز فار پاکستانی یوتھ ود ان دا کنٹری اینڈ ابراڈ جہاں تے جناب علی نواز میمر صاحب جن روشنی وجھندا ہن سلسلے میں ماں دعوت دین چاہندا محترم وائس چانسلر صاحب کے تا پان مہمان خصوصی جو تعارف کرائیں سر پلیز اٹس این آنر اینڈ پرویلیج فار می ٹو بی سیٹیڈ وتھ سچ اے رناؤنڈ پرسن لائک ادا علی نواز میمن He was amongst those early migrants to United States. He reached there on 31st December 1960. And uh, then in 1967, he joined World Bank. And in that capacity as an officer of the World Bank, he had been traveling to various countries, about 50 countries, as an expert and he had been advising various governments, various uh, 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 entities about um, improvements in the systems that they should bring in. So this is something that he has been doing. After his retirement from World Bank, again, he has not left his passion and he is even to this day engaged with the work that he had been doing for uh, other countries, but now his focus is Pakistan and uh, people of Sindh. Now he has started a program, Sindh Sudhar Sochung. It's a television program, which is broadcast by uh, Mehran TV. And uh, it is also available on YouTube. He's trying to actually share his experiences and his uh, uh, thoughts uh, that how improvement could be brought in the lot of common people in this land. It is an honor and a privilege for all of us that such a person is uh, amongst us and we would like to listen to him as well as uh, we would be inspired by all the vision that he has got for various sectors. I requested him that if we can deviate from the already decided topic to some extempore talk about how he sees Pakistan and how he sees that how Pakistan can progress. He has been the son of the soil and uh, he has coming regularly to this country and then he has spent about 58 years, more than 58 years in United States and he has seen so many countries in the world. So if he can give us an opinion, that can also be good for everyone that what he sees, how countries have been developing, how Japan developed, how United States is improving its education, and what is happening in Pakistan. So if a comparative sort of uh, vision, version can come out, that would be something great. Ada, I am extremely grateful for uh, your being with us this morning, and I don't want to be any hurdle further. So now all this audience that before you, you can start your talk, please. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here. Such handsome people, both men and women, and so young. My goodness, I, I would have thought that half of you will be undergraduate students. Uh, MashaAllah. So, Really, in a way, on occasion like this, I almost feel like crying. And uh, bear with me if tear comes to my uh, come to my eyes. When I think about what this country could have been, what our forefathers had in mind when they created Pakistan. And where are we today? In this period, so many countries have moved God knows how far. Some in positive way, some in negative way. We in Pakistan have, of course, <coughs> come forward in lot of ways. Our defense forces are probably the strongest in this part of the world. 
our politicians are the most smart in many ways, but the most crooked in many other ways. Our bureaucracy, the civil servants from beyond, are the, as they call them in Islamabad, Naib Qasids, are among well-to-do in this country. But where the real people, the common men and women of Pakistan have been left, it is, that is what brings tears to my eyes. In America and Europe and now even in China, you have, let us say, out of 100 who graduate from any school or any colleges, 95 to 96 percent turn into success. That many primary school students go to secondary schools and do well secondary student graduates go and get either vocational training which assures them of middle class existence or they go for further studies. Whereas with us here it was about five to six percent who turned out to be really successful whereas 95 percent or so, roughly depending on a specific area, they became different. So the population share which has been successful has become failures. I did my metric from government high school, Lord Kana, which was a government school. There was no tuition. I never got any tuition. And I did my metric in 1958 when the examination was held by Sindh University and not by the boards. Alhamdulillah, I was able, miracle, 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 I got first class, first position in the whole university. Now the person who got second position, his name was Khair Muhammad from Nawabsha. I was, I had appeared from Lord Khanna. Khair Muhammad got maybe out of 1100 marks, maybe he got nine or 10 marks less than I did. Many years later, when I was visiting Pakistan, I wanted to meet Khair Muhammad. I was told that he was headmaster in a government school in New Jatoi. So I went there to meet. First of all, I was shocked that Alhamdulillah, I am in the United States, hopefully playing a useful role in developing countries. And this man is only a uh, headmaster of a government school in small place called New Chatoi. But when I got there, I was told that he died five years ago. So here was a man who had as much promise as I did. But what did we do? What did our society do? Uh, what financial success he got? And how early he died? Whenever I go to Larkana, I try to <clears throat> meet as many classmates who are alive as possible. I came across a young man called Abdurazak Mehman. And I said, Razak, what do you do? He said, Ada, I'm a hajam. 
and now he's dead too. So my dear friends, I think that Pakistanis and Sindhis and Balochis and Punjabis, I don't like to use the word Muhajirs because Urdu speaking people are all born here, raised here. You are as much Sindhis and Pakistanis as anybody else. So, what is, I think you all are pretty successful, but what is going to happen to others who are not so fortunate? This is a challenge that Honorable VC has. This is a challenge that all of you have. I don't know how did you get here. Was your father able to send you through college and here? Or somebody else helped you along the way? But whatever the case was, you owe to our society that you help others. If nothing else that you can, when we say help somebody, we immediately think of money. But we don't always have money. But what you do have is guidance. Guidance to those who are not as successful. Guide them how you got here. Guide them what are the possible ways. I am fortunate, so I meet a different class of society. And I am able to guide in other way. Yesterday at lunch, I met somebody who is a practicing attorney here, but he is also on uh, selection board for scholarships to Europe. And he said, I was asking him, how many students are you able to sponsor from here? And he says, limited number. Because, and the reason is because not enough qualify. Whenever Ada Muhammad Ali comes to Washington, I know that he is uh, actively involved in management of Fulbright scholarships. And I ask him, how many were sent from Pakistan this year? How many Sindh? How many uh, urban? How many rural? And the biggest problem that our students are not able to get selected is, as he told me, that they haven't passed GRE. Now, I didn't say with good grades or upper percentiles, but they have not, nobody has told them that GRE is required to apply for a scholarship in the U.S. So you can do that. Also, yesterday at another uh, lunch, another dinner, I met somebody who has served as IG Synth, and he is now uh, a member of Public Service Commission. And I asked him, how, how are our boys and girls doing? He said, not as well as I like to see. I said, why? And he said, because they don't speak English well. And he said that English is very important because these are the people who once they are especially in uh, management cadres and so on, who will be becoming secretaries and even higher. They will be representing Pakistan in different delegations. They must know English so to communicate well and to make case of Pakistan. 
I am reminded of a sad story. I was visiting on an um, official mission to Pakistan. As I have been lucky to do, first time I came to, <coughs> I was selected there through a competitive process which is called uh, here like you have CSP, over there at the World Bank it is called YP program, Young Professional program. Minimum requirement to apply is you must have either PhD in field of interest to the bank. If you have PhD in Urdu or Sindhi, forget it, because that is not of interest to the World Bank. That is interest to the culture here, not too far. Maybe India, <coughs> maybe. So economics, law, business, administration, engineering, finance, whatever. Those are the fields of interest. So either a PhD or you must have degrees in two different fields of interest. In my case, since I did both undergraduate and graduate, uh, I did electrical engineering first and then worked and then MBA in finance. This is uh, the sort of quality. And again, you have to be good at some extracurricular activity. So the member of Public Service Commission, he told me that please advise whoever you meet who is interested in appearing competitive <laughs> exam to improve spoken English. Don't use Shakespeare language to communicate at Public Service Commission because not even England do they use the language of Shakespeare. Simple English which is spoken. And this is the same thing at the World Bank. And as I was saying, you need to have extracurricular activities. I did not get a PhD, but I did have two different fields. But that is not enough. In my, when people of this quality, and you have to be under 30 to apply. 10,000 students from all over the world had applied in uh, 1967 and only 16 were selected. <coughs> I was the only one from Pakistan. There were two from Great Britain, two from United States, one from Japan, <coughs> one from Mexico, uh, uh, one from Thailand, so really a big spectrum. There were three from India. Because as much Officially, we hate India. There is some education there. There is some practical education which is of interest to World Bank, United Nations, God knows all these places. So, and then as I said, other things. Now what were other things in my, in my case, and I'm sharing with you so that <clears throat> you will develop the same and you will convey to your students to do exactly the same. Now when I finished my electrical engineering, well, as I told you that I was, it was a miracle that I was first class, first position in matric. When I went to United States, I did MBA from University of Oregon. And I chose that because it was the cheapest university in America at that time. And that's all I could afford. Okay, now extracurricular activities. In, um, from high school days, we did debates, we published a magazine, we did so many extracurricular activities. Now, 
my interest was never electrical engineering. I was able to pass only because of strong math. When I was about four or five months before graduation, uh, I did not even go to the university employment office to get interviews with American companies because it is, it is now and it was even 50 years ago very difficult for foreigners to get good jobs. But surprisingly, they called me and they said Motorola company, I don't know if you have heard of it, it's a big electronics company. They had come to the campus and they told uh, the employment office that there's a boy called Ali Nawaz Mehman we want interview. So I went and they selected me. And they called me for interview in Chicago and then. When I went to join the company, they told me, well, we are sorry. Uh, you, of course, have a job here, but we don't want to use you as engineer. We have a Motorola overseas corporation, and we want you to become our sales administrator for Asia. I said, my God, alhamdulillah, I don't have to be engineer. Because they would have found out that I don't even know how to change a bulb or how to use a screwdriver. They would have fired me next day. So I say, Alhamdulillah, I'm out of that. But I did not know anything about international business either. So I worked for a while as sales administrator, but right away started taking MBA classes in Chicago at Northwestern University. But I learned it will take seven years to do MBA. That's why I went to Oregon. So this was a diverse part, diversity part, which counted because I said I am, uh, you know, engineer and I have sales and at international marketing level. When I had gotten to Illinois, by the way, my father, who has nine children had borrowed money from Synth Cooperative Bank to send me. So that was a burden on my head that how is he going to manage the family? So from day one, I went and I said, please give me a scholarship. They said, only if you get good grades at least for first semester, and then, so out of four, I had to have minimum 3.5 to get the scholarship and at least three to maintain it. So, alhamdulillah, I got that. But where I got the diversity that I started living in a hostel. Now, I was the only one from Asia in the whole thing. There was one African American race were all whites. Now there were uh, hostile elections. There were two very prominent white guys from Chicago who were contesting for House President. Both were excellent. But they were such competitors, they started fighting during the elections. And Somebody from the audience said, what nonsense. We don't want any of these. And uh, then somebody said, well, this boy, Ali Nawaz Mehman, uh, he's quiet, but I think he, we think he'll be able to keep peace. So let us elect him. So this is how I was elected president of the hostel. Now, another extracurricular activities. So there are <clears throat> many things, but what I'm telling you that as you must have done that too, you must have participated in extracurricular activities. Please guide your students. Ask them to do all these things and whatever else to have a chance in really good 
international companies and so on. So, my stories are many, but let me briefly touch on other subjects that Honorable Vice Chancellor uh, mentioned. My experiences in different countries. Let me start with Pakistan. I had since I started coming to Pakistan to deal with Wabdai and KAC, uh, they got to know me. They started offering me different jobs. But I said only if World Bank releases me. They say you can go as advisor, but not in an executive position. Finally, they when they offered me to be chairman of NEPRA, this was in 1996, so at least 19 years ago. And I was just turning 55. So of course, World Bank refused to release me. They say you can go as advisor, but not as a authority who will sign papers. So I took early retirement of some loss to my pension, but I still do get a pension. Now, if any of you um, have been in a little bit higher level, certainly uh, Dr. Saab would, would know that as a vice chancellor, he's pretty much free to do things, of course, within law, within the university. But he needs provincial or federal budget. He needs, if he needs to have some amendment in law, or he needs to get a new uh, members of syndicate or something, he has to go above. Now, what struck me here first was that the staff of whole organization, whatever you have, they consider their primary duty is to do khushamad to the number one. Now this I was never used to, I had never seen, not even in Africa, not in Asia, not in Latin America, as much as here. Now, every morning uh, when I will get to the office, and I, I usually got nine, I mean, there was no compromise on that, and left after the closing time. But whenever I left, of course, there will be the private secretary with his stay-at-home pad. Then I had a chief of staff who was a grade 20 guy. So he is always there to update me. Now he had a whole day to update me, but he wants to, even if he has updated me at 4.30, at 5 o'clock he must tell me, sir, since 4.30, this and this has happened. Usually nothing, but he has to be there. <laughs> then other people who have been communicating with me because I've asked them to do this or that, at least four or five of those will come, sir, I did succeed in talking to so-and-so. Sir, yes, he has promised. I mean, there is a lot of show-off going on. And the servants at home, how they pamper you. Uh, you know, uh, I wish I had five days to tell you all this. So this was the one. In other countries, I saw different issues. One of the first missions I went to was in, to Singapore. Actually, Malaysia and Singapore at the <coughs> combined mission. In Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, at that time, we were funding an um, underground sewerage project. Okay, so construction was going okay. But they said that we are having trouble with Singapore. Now, Singapore and Malaysia, until recently, had been one country. And those of you who, who were alive at that time would know that they even used to have combined airline, MS Malaysia Singapore airline or something like that. But now they have separated. So there were already problems with neighbors. So 
Malaysia gets, uh, Singapore does not have much of drinking water. And they have to get it from Malaysia. And there is, uh, again, those who have been there, there is the island of Singapore, and here is Malaysia, uh, and there's a bridge. And you can go across Johor Bridge. And uh, so Malaysia was providing the water. So Malaysia is saying, you know, they are paying us like one-tenth of one Singapore cent. And three Singapore dollars equal to one U.S. dollar at that time. So one-tenth of one cent per thousand gallons of water. He said, they said, look, this is not sustainable. Uh, price, uh, even the cost of treating this water, of pumping this water is much higher. So he said, please help us. So fortunately, since we were going there, we were able to talk to Singapore authorities. But you know, to this date, like Kashmir issue, that price of water issue has not been settled. And now, realistic will be uh, one U.S. dollar per thousand gallon bulk water. And they still get a fraction of one cent. So some problems remain. Okay. Now, Singapore, which today has per capita of income of over $60,000, U.S. dollars, per person per capita, where U.S. per capita income is around a little more than 40,000 U.S. So it has come so far. But in 68, there was no five-star hotel in Singapore, whereas we did. We had intercontinental Karachi, Lahore, Rawalpindi, uh, I believe even Dhaka. Singapore did not. There was one old uh, Rafael Hotel, which is old English type of hotel. Now, you have heard all the stories of what terrible condition World Bank imposes to give loans to some countries. It has not been the case in case of uh, missions which I was leading. Now, in Singapore, one of the most important conditions that we imposed to grant them loan was about management. Now, what's wrong with the management? You know, they had a Englishman as <coughs> managing director of the company was called and is still called PUB, Public Utilities Board. It had <coughs> power, water, uh, gas, telecom, different things. So the general manager or managing director was an Englishman. Chief engineer was a Polish guy, very heavy man from Poland. Now the CFO was a Chinese man, I believe, from Singapore. We said that you <coughs> must get native people to be top positions. And you can hire whoever you feel is competent to be, uh, to be advisors. And the main job of the advisor, foreign advisor, should be really to train the local counterpart who will assume. So that was a main condition. And we said, within two years, you must recruit people from Singapore. And as you may know, Singapore majority is uh, Chinese. Uh, number two is Malay from Malaysia or Indonesia. Number three is South Indian, usually, Tamil or some Pakistanis. Two years later, they were able, they still did not get a MD 
from Singapore, but they found a Chinese from Australia whom they brought. Okay, compromise. <laughs> Chief engineer, still they did not find. And today, Singapore is one of the most <coughs> developed countries. Why? I think Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew had something to do with it. Democracy did have something to do with it. But democracy in, uh, in Singapore or even America does not mean or not limited to come every five years or four years and vote. Then go and sleep and let them rule you like slaves. Let them steal you from you like anything. No. Democracy <coughs> means continued participation of the people. If the member of parliament does not meet his constituents regularly, rest assured they will not be re-elected. So, no corruption. I think one of, since then I have been to Singapore maybe 30 <coughs> times on different things. In year four or five, they introduce that you, if you smoke, you are smoking, and throw the cigarette butt on the floor, on a road or sidewalk, 50 Singapore dollar fine on the spot, or you go to jail. And you could see how that culture changed within months. Now let me give you example of a failed state. And you can then draw your own conclusions. You know, in Pakistan, we say, not openly, but in drawing room conversation, that we should hang this, 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 this. Well, in Liberia was a country which was created by America in Africa so that they could return some of the slaves to back to Africa. So they created this country. But when those uh, farmer slaves started ruling this land, they became worst masters. <coughs> so there was a coup. And I, I had, by that time, gone maybe 10, 12 times to Liberia. We were helping to uh, build a dam there and many other things. I read a newspaper and heard on news that there was a coup in Liberia by a sergeant, not by a general or colonel, by a sergeant, by the name of Sergeant Doe. And what he had done, he and his soldiers shot the president and vice president right away on the spot. They collected all the ministers, asked them to take off their clothes, walked them naked in the street of Monrovia, which is the capital of <coughs> Liberia. They brought them to an open field, asked them to dig a big ditch. They dug the bitch, uh, ditch and they started shooting them one by one until they all were finished. Then they left. Now the minister for electric power that I used to deal with, his name was Taylor Major. I was less than 30 years old that time, and Taylor Major was maybe 55, 60. So he used to say, Mr. Mayman, I know you are from World Bank, but you are my nephew. OK. And I used to say, OK, Uncle Taylor Major. So it was very close. And I understood that he's dead, too, in this coup. Seven years later, there was uh, my secretary came in in Washington and said, some man called Taylor Major is here to see. I said, Taylor Major, I know, is dead. Please call him in. 
and sure it was him. You know, I hugged him and so on. He cried, I cried. I said, what happened? You were supposed to be dead. He said, yes, they paraded me naked in the street with others. But as they started shooting, I became so afraid that I just fell in that, in that ditch. And others fell on top of me. So I did not die. So then what happened to you? And he said, well, you know, later uh, when they were closing off the ditch, I cried and they got me out. They did not shoot me, but took me to a jail. What was a jail? Nothing, no bed, nothing. They gave me one sheet of cloth. You know, chadar or good, as we call it in Sindhi. He said, this is all you get. In daytime, I put it around me. At night, night time, I uh, took it out. I had to sleep on the concrete floor and cover myself. He said, this is how I spent seven years. What saved him eventually is that he had studied engineering in Washington. And his wife of, was a black lady from Washington. So she eventually was able to persuade US government who got it out. Now what happened to Liberia after that harsh coup? Sergeant Doe, you know, promptly promoted himself to rank of general. He became more cruel than others, and since then there have been many, many worse situations. So that revolution did not work out there. There have been other revolutions uh, that you must have read in history. If you have not, please do read history, and you will find. Uh, what happened to Russia after the revolution, what happened to France, uh, what happened to China, what happened to Iran, what happened to other places. But there are varying degrees of successes. I must say, among all these, Chinese model attracts me more. It is, is still a sort of one-party rule. But in last 15, 20 years, they have able to raise their standard of living for common persons so much that about 800 million Chinese have moved from extreme poverty to middle class. Frankly, for a country, for a state, to me, that is the number one criteria. It's my way of thinking, that welfare of people is number one. I will tolerate little bit dictatorship. I prefer full democracy, but I will tolerate that if it can make our common people, our arm and son, into a quality human being. So time is flying. And uh, I will just uh, wrap up with observations of Pakistan, uh, my visit to Lord Khanna, I mean to Pakistan. I must say I have limited myself to Sindh area. But I have been, to, of course, to Karachi, Hyderabad, um, Bhittai and um, Sevan and Larkana and Sakhar and Kharpur, many places. So I have some feeling. Everybody knows, of course, I have enjoyed meeting relatives and old family, wonderful things. But problems that I have seen and I leave them up to you, who are the brightest of our country here, to think about them and find solutions. I have, of course, always heard of the population problem. Too many people. 
But the population that I have seen here this time, I have not seen ever before. Many years ago, uh, I was visiting India, Calcutta. And those of you who have been there know that Chorangi is the center of uh, Calcutta. It was so crowded that I could not walk like this and breathe. I had to do like this, to breathe. And this time, I have seen that in bazaars of Karachi. I've seen that in bazaars of Larkana and others. So that population is a serious issue. We all know about water shortage. We also know about water quality. But I had a meeting with the Pro Vice Chancellor of Engineering University. I won't take names. He has PhD in water resource management. And he said, sir, the most alarming thing that has happened here, that from uh, Jacoba to Karachi, we have taken about 5,000 samples. And all the samples of water have fungus in it. Now, normal chlorination that we do to treat water. Of course, we do filtration, sedimentation, and eventually uh, chlorination. He said, that's not enough. We need to find and apply a bulk water level. So that is going to be a lot of people are going to be dying from diseases and even cancers. You have to think about that. Extreme poor, extreme rich. Corruption of uh, our government, of course, in Sindh, and at all levels. I hope somebody does not make me disappear today when I say that our biggest problem is like this. Imagine you are the bread and earner in your house. Your salary, if you are lucky, is one lakh rupees. Okay? Now, you have to pay 50,000 for your chokidar. <coughs> and you are doing that for a long time, either directly or indirectly through benefit. Then it becomes 70,000. What are you going to do? And when you talk to the Chokidar, he says that, sir, the security is the most important thing. And that this is what our neighborhood is so bad security. Now, are you going to allow that to happen? What are you going to do with 30,000 when your salary is 1,000? This is one of the most dangerous problems that this country is facing. How it happens, maybe you go to head of your tribe and say, please make my peace with all these bad people who are living around. <coughs> Maybe you, could, you can move to another neighbor, neighborhood, but as a country to move, it may be a little bit difficult. So whatever you do, we have to either raise our income substantially or to control our expenses. Other we always think, oh, we are such an important country. We are such a strategically important country. We'll always get money. Well, it has stopped happening. So, my dear friends, God bless you. God make you successful. I hope you will help 
your younger generations, your neighborhood and everyone so that they will be in your place. And above all, I pray that we all will survive. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm again grateful to Ada Ali Nawaz Memon for sparing his uh, time to be with us. I personally uh, got the feeling that it was one of the best uh, address that we heard uh, about various aspects. And uh, as he has been in very various positions, very high positions, he has seen the world from very close. So that way his observations, they carry their own weight. And uh, the points that he raised during this discussion, during his address, what Pakistan is facing and what can be the uh, implications of those issues, they are thought-provoking. And uh, I would uh, believe that you would, be st you would start thinking about those things. And if we can find out some solution, because these are the issues that we have to resolve in any case. This is the stake uh, that we, it is with us. We are the stakeholders. So, as you very rightly said, that world will not be coming to us again and again with uh, bundles of dollars and everything. Though somehow or the other it happens. Every time we believe that now there would be no one who would be bringing money. Today I was reading in the newspaper and that the closest ally to President Trump, he has been on the visit to Pakistan. And yesterday he said that as Pakistan had helped a lot in bringing Taliban on the negotiation table, so now America is ready to enter into free, free trade agreement, FTA they call it, which they were denying for a very long time. So now that means there would be some favor that would be extended to Pakistan. So a strategic location is again important. And uh, there was one, um, uh, Emma Duncan's book, and she, uh, she wrote that Pakistan exports three things, uh, cotton, heroin, and a strategic location. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that way, it is uh, something that it always comes to our rescue. So while we should be careful and we should be thoughtful about standing on our own feet and um, trying to get things done within a, uh, the limit that is uh, available with us. But I personally feel that there are quite few things that Pakistan has done which we should all be proud of. And uh, there are many things, the universities, these very talented young men and women, even in the Fulbright Scholarship Program that I had been uh, on the board of directors, I was always impressed with the talent that Pakistan has been uh, actually uh, producing in various walks of life. So if we can improve just one thing, that is education, capacity building of people, I think many of the ills that we are facing today, that can be addressed. Population growth is to be controlled. And uh, rest of the issues, they will, inshallah, ta'ala, get resolved. So on this note, we end today's session. And uh, I thank you all the participants who have been here for being with us and have a good time and have a good lunch. Thank you. Bye.